Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Facebook Live session to promote our new textbook, Ketogenic. And with me today, I have two esteemed authors of the chapter Cardiovascular Disease and its Association with Insulin Resistance as part of our Medical Nutrition Therapy chapter. Now, if you've been watching these Facebook Lives, you know that we've been talking a lot about insulin resistance. And if we consider that the cardiovascular system is the main nutrient delivery system, then you can see how insulin resistance is implicated or that the cardiovascular system is tied intimately with metabolic health and how insulin resistance can be implicated in atherosclerosis through numerous pathophysiologies. And it can be associated with a variety of problems from stroke, renal failure, to congestive heart failure and myocardial infarction. Now for years, those of us who've been trained have been trained in the traditional model of um, the lipid heart, the diet lipid heart hypothesis, which as we know, wrongfully demonizes LDL, which is a biologically essential multifunctional transport nutrient. And in this chapter, we're going to be looking at the evidence for the use and the role of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, despite its high fat and cholesterol content, which worries many practitioners, the role that TCR has in reducing insulin resistance and improving overall cardiometabolic risk factors. I would like to introduce our esteemed authors Dr. Nadir Ali is a cardiologist in Webster, Texas, and is affi affiliated with the Houston Healthcare Clear Lake. He's a practicing interventional cardiologist in the Clear Lake and Houston community for over 30 years, with several years experience in low carbohydrate, high fat diets in the treatment of metabolic disease, diabetes, heart disease, and to improve the quality of cholesterol. In addition, he and his team give diet, free diet seminars for his patients once a month on the last Wednesday of every month at 6 p.m. at the Clear Lake Heart and Vascular um, Institute, which has over 100 attendees consistently for the last four years. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali, and, and welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Hasina. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to be here and I look forward to interacting with your Facebook audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd also love to introduce Dr. David Diamond, who is a neuroscientist and a professor at the University of South Florida. He has researched neurological conditions leading to forgetfulness, um, especially associated with people under stress and how they become forgetful. But he is also known for his research in high cholesterol as, a car um, as cardiovascular risk. And he's contributed um, a, chapter, a part of the chapter, which we'll speak about later. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Diamond. Uh, thank you for including me um, in the uh, Facebook Live session today. And it, it really is an honor for me to be included in this chapter. Thanks so much. So I'm going to open the floor to both of you. And of course, we know that, uh, um, especially Dr. Ali, this is your field of practice, that card the diagnosis of any cardio um, cardiac disease is most life altering, and it's often sudden. And once you are faced with the patient who has developed cardiovascular disease, it's often at a very late stage. Um, and as an interventional cardiologist, I mean, I know that when you people are wanting to go into residency, you know, that is the high stress environment because you're always having to be in tip top form, 2 a.m., whatever time of the morning. So obviously we've been barking up the wrong tree and we're here to talk prevention and look at the bigger picture that's been ignored. So as an introduction, is there something that you'd like to say about that? Oh, absolutely. I think that for years and years, and I would say I can go back to about 100 years, but especially in the last 40 years, nutritional advice 
for health has been completely misplaced. There is a wrong emphasis on saturated fats, which has changed our dietary patterns towards more uh, refined and added sugar and processed food. And the biggest component of going away from saturated fat is an enormous increase in something that human populations have never been exposed to. And that is polyunsaturated vegetable oils, which really create havoc. They create, they are absolute toxins. And dare I say that we, me and David have the audacity or the nerve or the courage to stand up against the dietary guidelines and say that the emphasis on reduction of saturated fat is completely wrong. And the emphasis to consume vegetable oils in the form of canola, soybean, saf sunflower and safflower oil is so misplaced. And I think this is the primary driver of heart disease and dementia and cancers and diabetes and obesity. It's getting the whole world sick and obese. And one of the best things that this book will do is to spread this information so that people can regain their health. So I guess that's, I want to hear what the audience has to say at this point. Thank you so much. David, do you have anything to just talk about the road we've traveled and um, you know how this perception that people have, people have trust in this diet heart hypothesis. It's infiltrated generations. So when even people who've been on um, a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, it takes a while to get over that mental um, fat phobia. So, you know, the, the, the advertising and the marketing to demonize fat, it's come a long way. And to be able to get that out of people's minds and to concentrate on real food, it's, it, it, it's happening already, as we know, but it's going to take some hard work and time. Any comments? So, uh, first of all, you've given a great introduction. Um, and Nadir also has emphasized the importance that we have a truly novel and toxic component of our diet, which is insidious. And that is the, the vegetable oils. You, you pretty much can't have, almost any food you have in a restaurant will have soybean oil. Almost all of your salad dressings are made with soybean oil, especially if you're you know, going to a restaurant. It's really tough to find one, for example, that's made with avocado oil, or if you have olive oil, which are far superior health-wise. But let me also add um, the importance of high blood sugar. So this combination of high blood sugar, which occurs as a result of our, for the first time in evolutionary history, we have ready access to carbohydrates. In the, in the natural world, there really isn't much in the way of a source of food that'll dramatically raise our blood sugar. This is just completely unnatural, which is really only the last century or so, in which we have access to food that chronically elevates our blood sugar. And as a result, we have chronically elevated insulin, which, and I give really credit to Nadir for covering this so well. We also have a review out a few years ago in which that chronic elevation of insulin is really contributing to so much of our health problems. And then you have a decreased sensitivity of the insulin receptors which then results in chronically elevated blood sugar. And what is the response by the medical community? To take medication. And this is really the problem. We treat the symptoms, which could be high blood sugar with medication, to potentially change the functioning of our kidneys to then force that blood sugar into our kidneys, out our bladder, which then increases the likelihood that we have bacterial growth. So it's a completely wrong way of thinking. What we need to target is the root cause of our health problems. First of all, and I completely agree with Nadir, we need to target those vegetable oils. And it really pays to look at the ingredients. If a food has a vegetable oil, as he said, soybean, corn oil, safflower, 
what we really want to is just don't don't consume it. Uh, the second thing is this high blood sugar literally is it, it can damage the proteins in our body. It's called a process called glycation. When that sugar attaches itself to our proteins, it damages the proteins. And that's the one two combination that is so unhealthy. So my strongest recommendation to people is to be aware of the corrosive properties of high blood sugar in combination with the harm caused by the vegetable oils. Thanks so much to both of you. Um, you know, I've written the metabolic chapter and I'm very interested in insulin resistance um, as a whole. And I like to think of it as the pool of inflammation, whatever you're adding to that pool of inflammation. And I, it seems simplified, but if you're, if you're thinking about the vegetable oils, if you're thinking about the effects of high blood glucose, you know, and the imbalance in the redox reaction that occurs. And if you're thinking about um, wiping out your um, anti-inflammatory molecules, um, and if you're thinking about things like poor sleep, the effect that smoking has, it's all in effect increasing inflammation. But I wanna start with um, Nadir, you've written, um, I love the approach where you describe the anatomy of the blood vessels. So you've gone through the different layers of the blood vessels. Um, you've spoken about the architecture and how it is susceptible to plaque. Now in this situation that David has described so beautifully of this new era where we're exposed to um, unnatural levels of nutrients, uh, that, that these blood vessels are being absorbed and it's going straight into those blood vessels. Can you just give us a brief understanding of why our blood vessels, uh, you know, there's a conventional way that we think too much fat, it goes down the blood vessel and clogs up the blood vessel, but that's not what happens. How do you explain to your patients um, why those blood vessels are susceptible to uh, plaque formation? So it's very interesting, you know, I have been accused of being a nerd and I like to get into the mechanistic aspects of why something happens. And I think that human blood vessels are susceptible to some damage on a regular basis. It's because of the stress of life, because of aging, because of inflammation. Now, modern diet contributes a lot to it. Like for example, what David was saying from two standpoints, we are what we eat. So the worldwide consumption of refined sugar and vegetable oils. Now, let me focus a little bit on vegetable oils first and then go on to sugar. So if you look at vegetable oil, if we used to consume about 80 to 100 grams of fat per day in 1900, that fat predominantly came from butter, uh, lard, or beef tallow. Now, beef tallow is perhaps one of the best kind of animal fat to cook your food in. Now, of that 100, let's say it was 100 grams, of that 100 grams, 86 of those grams have been replaced by these modern production of vegetable oils. And bear with me for a second. These vegetable oils are harvested, are, are, are produced synthetically in a way in which they're using hexane, which is from crude oil. They subject these oils to very high temperatures. It's almost like an oil refinery, these plants that make these oils. And about 30% of our calories are coming from it. And what we don't realize is that all our cells, like the cells of the blood vessel, the endothelial cells that line the blood vessel, the media that has the smooth muscle cells, the adventitia that has the fat, which is the outer wall of the vessel, all of these cells will be replacing the saturated fat that forms the wall of the vessel with these polyunsaturated fatty acids. If you look at a, a plaque or an endothelial cell, 
back in 1900, the amount of omega-6 fatty acids, which is the primary fatty acid present in the vegetable oils, would have been somewhere in the range of five to 7%. And if memory serves me correct, in the year 2000, that number had increased to maybe about 23%, and perhaps it's higher. So these blood vessels now are a lot more susceptible to damage because these fatty acids are unstable. They get oxidized. In another way of explaining that is that they rob an electron from another healthy molecule and create inflammation. And we don't have enough antioxidants to deal with this. So as a result, we are at higher risk of atherosclerosis or damage to the blood vessel wall, not just because we are consuming a lot more added sugar, like, Dave, uh, like David Diamond pointed out, that these added sugars increase insulin. Insulin is a driver of atherosclerosis from multiple different standpoints. It increases blood pressure. It makes the cell damaged because it doesn't have enough mitochondria to defend itself. And as a result of this, what is happening is that the body is trying to protect itself and in the process of protecting, it sends out LDL molecules to repair the damage. The LDL gets oxidized in the process of repairing it. And we are blaming the LDL for the cause of atherosclerosis, whereas we should be going to the root cause. What caused the blood vessel to become unstable and inflamed in the first place? And the reason for that is primarily the way we eat, what we eat, and the two biggest culprits that if we can really point to is added sugar as well as vegetable oils. If we remove these two, I think that the degree of benefit to society from a medical standpoint will be tremendous. Hmm. Thank you so much. So you you've simplified what is a very beautifully elegantly written chapter um so congratulations for that um there is something that you mentioned called the outside in model mm -hmm. it's going a little bit deeper into the understanding of the pathophysiology but i want to um ask you to comment on you know, if, if people people say, so the way we got down this route is that postmortems were done and fatty streaks and, you know, plaque buildup was found. So the realization, which is quite disappointing, that the medical fraternity has followed this route and continues to do so in the year 2023, is that it is the cause, fat is the cause. So the, it's too much fat. It went down the vessel and it bunged it up. So if you could just highlight again, why is there fat in the vessel? Oh, absolutely. So let's imagine that our blood vessels are now filled with unstable fat molecules called PUFA or omega-6, and they cause inflammation. And when there's inflammation, there is tissue damage. The wall of the blood vessel, which is endothelium, can get denuded and it can denude, get denuded very easily with stress. Whereas if our wall was more stable and not inflamed, the stress of life that might increase blood pressure would not damage the endothelium that easily. Once the endothelium is damaged, there should be a repair process. And our body is very good at repairing damage. And in the process of repair, LDL comes to that location. Um, a particular form of LDL called LP little a is also something that gets attracted to an area of damage. Now, what the LDL is doing is that it's promoting endothelial regrowth. It's repairing that damage through coagulation system. And in many cases, when there is inflammation, 
there is recruitment of macrophages. Macrophages are these blood cells that come in and take away debris. So if I were to tell my audience that the LDL is a very important antioxidant, it has antioxidants in it like vitamin E and CoQ10. So it first sacrifices the vitamin E and CoQ10 to dampen the inflammation. But sometimes if the inflammation is excessive, then the wall of the LDL, which is made up of phospholipid, then undergoes damage and it's called an oxidized LDL. Now the oxidized LDL is really a firefighter. It's not an arsonist. It's come in to help put out the fire created by inflammation. And when it is damaged, when it's oxidized, now it is picked up by specific receptors on the macrophages. And these macrophages pick up this LDL cholesterol and there are mechanisms for the macrophages to then subsequently give up that cholesterol that they have taken up to an HDL molecule, which is in the process of causing what is called reverse cholesterol transport. But there are times in which, especially with what we see these days called metabolic syndrome in which you have high amount of triglycerides and consequently low amount of HDL, which is basically what you would get if you follow a diet that is promoted by the department, the US Department of Agriculture, the American Heart Association, the Harvard uh, Preventive Medicine Group or the Tufts Nutrition School. And I can go on and on what you would then have is metabolic syndrome. You would have high triglycerides, which is high fat and blood, low HDL. You don't have repair mechanisms for the blood vessel anymore. The macrophage gets filled with LDL cholesterol, which is oxidized. It stays there and it becomes a foam cell. So now when you go and take a look at the atherosclerotic plaque under microscope, you would see these foam cells. You would see lipids in it you would see an LDL molecule in it or remnants of LDL molecule. Now, what do you do? You say LDL is the culprit, let's wipe it out. On the other hand, there should be a new paradigm saying that there is something that caused the inflammation. There is a reason why the LDL is there to dampen the inflammation. Let's work at the root cause. Um, now, there are a few people who think that the reason for atherosclerosis is an outside-in hypothesis, which means that the adventitia of our blood vessel is that the outer layer is lined with a lot of basa vesoro. These are vessels that are feeding the blood vessels. And they think that the inflammation is coming from outside in rather than the primary cause being the damage to the endothelium. I think that both processes are possible, but I would rather think that there is first damage to the endothelium. So the inside and hypothesis, the, inside, the, the hypothesis that atherosclerosis is starting from inside the blood vessel is perhaps more likely. And I'm sure that David will contribute to this and he may have certain very key paradigms to add to that. I'm just going to share my screen. I'm not sure if that can be seen. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's the diagram that I created. I hope people like yeah. it. Yeah. So I just wanted to bring that up. Maybe it's not the best one. Let me just see. Um, just, you know, it, it's, it's actually a lot clearer when you can see the picture. So I wonder. Are you exactly are you able to see that? Yeah, so there's your, sorry. Go ahead. That's your picture where you were describing step by step that injury. And so if so, people can see the step by step mechanisms um, that you've described, it's easier and it makes absolute sense um, that that is the, the pathophysiology um, of, of disease. Well, thank you, Hasina. And I think this picture. I mean, it's fairly clear to me, and I think uh, you can see, I don't know if people can see my mouse, probably not, 
but maybe you can use your mouse. There, there it is your mouse. If you take it to the LDL molecule right there on A, yeah. Mm -hmm. That LDL is now coming to a area of the blood vessel where the endothelium, which is blue in color, is denuded. Right. So the endothelial mat matrix is then exposed. So, so just if I could just stop you in, in between. So it starts with injury. And that Correct. injury can be from stress of daily life. But if you are eating a healthy diet, then you possess, I mean, life itself is stressful. We possess, like we have procoagulants and anticoagulants, we also have pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory molecules in order to balance that stress. So in a normal situation where you're eating healthily and you haven't depleted your mitochondrial stores and your, um, your, your, your antioxidants, you are then able to repair, self-repair. But in a situation where you're eating poorly and you're, you've pushed yourself all the way to the end of the scale, you've got this situation of denuded endothelium and that's where you're saying it all starts. Well, it doesn't Absolutely. start there, but that's, that's the critical um, endothelial part. I couldn't agree more. And you can see that there's an oxidized LDL out there with a red uh, a motif out attached to it. And that oxidized LDL is damaged LDL like for example, when the oxidized LDL is there, the liver does not pick it up because that's not liver's job. Liver's job is to recycle healthy LDL. The oxidized LDL is picked up by macrophage, which is in yellow out there. And if you have good repair mechanisms, like you have normal levels of HDL, that damaged oxidized LDL is extruded by the macrophages to a waiting HDL molecule that then recycles it back to the LDL, back to the liver. And so that's the repair mechanisms mm -hmm. that we are disrupting through yeah. the diet and lifestyle that is being recommended by most of the healthcare organizations. Right. Thank you so much. So what we've done is basically shot ourselves in the foot by barking up the wrong tree. Um, and so David. Uh, I like so, the metaphors, um, Hasina, mixed as they are. <laughs> so, so, so obviously I can, and I think we all can um, agree and empathize that as doctors, you want to do the best for your patients. And none of this comes from um, a need to cause more disease or to worsen the situation or even to make money. I have many friends and colleagues who are doctors, and I don't know one of them, you know, that, that are do, practicing medicine to make bucks from the pharmaceutical company. So I think everybody is going at it for the right reason. And so obviously, they think that the fat is the problem. And now, wow, here's this miracle drug that's going to reduce your fat. But as um, Dr. Ali has already said, by taking these drugs, you're actually lowering your protective mechanisms even more. So you've written about, and you've got a lot of information, and you've done a lot of research about statin being the so-called miracle drug. Can you just lead us up to how we got there um, and, and how we, we've got it so wrong? Well, thank you again, Hasina, for the compliments. And, and let's just be clear on the ambiguity of the title doctor. So I'm a, I'm a PhD, so I don't treat patients. I'm not a clinician, I'm a scientist. Uh, I received no sponsorship at all for the work that I've done. In fact, I've talked about how it was my own elevated triglycerides that enabled me then to want to study heart disease. So neuroscience is my primary area, but the reason why I'm interested in cardiovascular disease is because I was 25 years ago, but it's such high risk for developing heart disease. So this is now my second career and solely as a scientist. Uh, but I also just, I wanna say, the, the contrast between the scholarship, the brilliance, the technical expertise that you saw from Nadir 
is so obvious, so stark, when you think of where America was 70 years ago, 1950s, we had someone named Ansel Keys who knew nothing about heart disease and nothing really about nutrition. And he became the dominant figure in American nutrition and heart disease research. He came up with this idea of the diet heart hypothesis, so simplistic in, how, in its, how stark it is to what we know now, which is simply you consume animal fat, it raises your LDL and therefore you have heart disease. And it's remarkable that it has survived to the present time. And I would say the reason why it has survived is because it is relatively easy to lower LDL levels. You can lower LDL by becoming a vegetarian or by taking the medication for decades. There are primitive medications. We now have the modern medications. Um, if you consume corn oil, you lower your LDL. So there are vast profits that are made in multiple industries from lowering LDL. And so the, the person on Facebook may be wondering, well, why do we care so much about lowering LDL? Realize we have trillions of dollars of revenue that have gone into lowering LDL. And what you do find, certainly not with corn oil, people who consume corn oil actually had more heart attacks, but the corn oil industry doesn't like to promote that. You do find a relatively small percentage of people do have fewer heart attacks and strokes when they're put on the statins. And this is now relatively modern um, pharmacology um, in which you interfere with cholesterol production. It changes LDL receptors. And there can be a dramatic reduction in LDL levels. And so I appreciate you including me in this and, and perhaps the, the viewer really needs to know, well, how protected are you when you take a statin? And realize we have tens of millions of people who are taking a statin, partly because their doctor tells them they're dramatically lowering their risk of having a heart attack. And so it's important to understand how these studies are done. And I'm giving you this a typical study other than heart failure studies in which there is a relatively high incidence of heart attack and, and death, most studies in which you have people even at risk of a heart attack, the majority of people don't have heart attacks in these studies. And this is a real number. So you follow people who are likely to have a heart attack for three years and you do nothing. You give them a placebo. And 98% of those people do not have a heart attack during the three year study, which you can imagine is very difficult because then the primary advice should be, well, these people were in the study because they're at risk of having a heart attack and 98% of them did not have a heart attack doing nothing. And you have the people on the statin and 99% of them did not have a heart attack. So the real difference across decades of studies is about 1%. And this has been quantified over and over. So one, there are two things really people should say. The doctor should say to the patients, if you do nothing, then you have a 98% chance of not having a heart attack and then stop right there. Or if I give you this statin and in our papers, we have quantified dozens of peer reviewed medical papers that show the adverse effects of statins. Statins can damage the muscles, interfere with brain functioning, liver functioning, kidney functioning, so if I give you the statin and you take that statin now, you're actually improving the, your outcome only by 1%, which means only one out of every 100 people given a statin will have one less heart attack over the next three years. That's rather trivial. And so that's not about to generate a trillion dollars in revenue. So what's another way of presenting the data? Well, realize one is 50% of two, okay, so 2% 2 of the people will have a heart attack if, if you do nothing. 1% of the people have a heart attack if you give them a statin. So one is 50% of two. And then you look at the ads and you look at what physicians are told, statins reduce heart attacks by 50%. And we actually have a paper out in which we've summarized this research because when doctors, not just lay people, when doctors hear about a 50% reduction in heart attacks, they are led to believe that half of all their patients will not have a heart attack when the real number is just 1% of their patients will not have a heart attack. And that 1% benefit is very much offset 
by significant increases in adverse effects, just the increase in diabetes. There's a really nice study out of Scandinavia in which you have, nobody has diabetes in the beginning, type two diabetes, and you put half of the people on a statin, half are given placebo, and six years later, about 6% of the people spontaneously develop type two diabetes on the placebo, but 11% of the people on the statin develop type two diabetes. So realize it's far greater chance of developing diabetes, which now increases your risk of developing cancer and Alzheimer's disease, as well as heart disease, by going on the statin for that 1% benefit. And again, let's keep in mind, and I, I sort of commend the drug companies for presenting this incredibly small benefit. They're not cheating. They're putting it right out there. They're saying you have a 1% chance of a reduction of a heart attack. This is from the drug company sponsored studies. Can you imagine if we had a vaccine for a disease which enabled only 1% of people to benefit from the, vac from the vaccine? And so this is so important for people to understand is how they play games with the statistics. And this is something we have published papers on and we actually have a new paper which will be coming out which we reviewed this, the games that people play with these statistics. Thank you so much, you know, and, 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 and David, the, the, the main, it's, it's absolute misinformation on the one hand, Yes. And on the other hand, my experience running the high care unit of an emergency unit, which was closely attached to the coronary care unit, uh, Nadir, is that um, I, my patients were predominantly, the, the, the unit was too small, the cardiovascular unit was too small to cater to all the cardiovascular patients, which, ha which resulted in the high care unit being um, the coronary care unit. So there was one particular round that I did where 100% of the patients were patients who had had an acute coronary event, acute, uh, you know, coronary artery disease. And so, you know, this, this is those who make it to the hospital. Um, it, it's already a situation where they've got cardiac dysfunction, most of them, because they may not have accessed care quickly enough. But the treatment at that point in the hospital in which I worked was statins, beta blockers, aspirin, dietitian. And <laughs> goodbye and see you, you know, if, if the hospital has a rehab center, we'll see you in the rehab center in a few weeks time. And then you get seen by a biokineticist and the dietitian, but really the information that's given from the doctor's side is these are the drugs that will uh, in, in, improve your, morta your uh, mortality risk, or reduce, sorry, reduce your mortali mortality risk, okay? Um, where the real information is not given. So the dietitian then puts them on the low fat diet and the, 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 the role of the doctor, um, many people aren't able to access, you know, an interventional cardiologist and they get put on um, clot busting therapy and that kind of thing. But, you know, when you say, David, that those patients um, put on statin therapy over that period of time, then developed um, diabetes, it's also obvious that they, the root cause wasn't treated. So not only were they put on a statin that has risk factors, but they're also still with the, the way I like to describe it to my patients is if you've got a hole in your roof and it's leaking and you can see a big mess and damp spot and paint bubbling and you say, oh, here's the treatment. The treatment is polyfiller. Just scrape it off, put some polyfiller on and year after year after year, you're not treating the root cause. So this is what really angers me and frustrates me because at the root of all of this is the patient. Not only are we not giving that patient the best information that we have available, we're not even open to thinking about it, many of our colleagues, we're simply putting on a little band-aid, which is fed by misinformation. So that was my little rant. Um, and I think both of, you, both of you can agree that 
um, you know, with, with a tremendous number of patients coming in, we really do need to talk about the therapeutics. So I'm going to move on to the role of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction. And um, Dr. Nadir, can you, you know, you, you also in your, in your chapter, you talk about um, the role, um, you, you talk about lipoproteins as a surrogate marker for the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. Um, and then, you know, you go into the details of the optimal sort of lipid profile for health versus one that signifies metabolic mayhem. Can you touch on that a little bit? So if somebody's looking at their lipoproteins, just what 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 does that information tell you about your patient? Uh, sure, absolutely. So Lipoproteins are a good marker of your health and of your insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. In fact, a poor man's way of knowing that you have insulin resistance is if you have high triglycerides and low HDL. You know, that defines insulin resistance. And if you have that kind of a picture, by design, your LDL is going to be somewhat oxidized. So you will have more oxidized LDL because they're participating in inflammation and repair. You will have more of the small dense LDL molecules. So the LDL will not be healthy at that point. So a person who is being appropriately counseled, and I think that the most important aspect that I wanna to emphasize to physicians and to patients is that medicine should no longer be considered prescriptive. Like you said, a Band-Aid. So you're giving a statin, you're giving beta blockers, you're giving aspirin. These are all Band-Aids. The real prescription would be to tell them that, hey, you need to reduce added sugar and processed food. You need to do intermittent fasting. You need to improve exercise so that you improve mitochondrial health, so that you improve uh, metabolic syndrome, you improve insulin sensitivity. So the benefit of talking about non-prescriptive medicine in a situation like a person presenting with chest pain or acute coronary syndrome or the presence of heart disease is lost. Instead of that, they're given prescriptions and then they're given a dietitian who's going to tell them low saturated fat diet, low, uh, low fat diet. What both of these things mean is that you're going to increase the intake of refined sugar and processed food because when you go low fat, you're going to go high in carbs. When you go low in saturated fat, you're going to go high in vegetable oils that's going to make their situation worse. They're going to get obese, their heart disease is going to progress, they're going to become diabetic, and their metabolic syndrome is going to get worse. So I think that as a medical profession, we have absolutely failed in giving the right treatment for our patients. And the key opinion leaders in medical profession are all bought out by the industry, by the pharmaceutical industry. I'm sorry that me and David are on the same wavelength on here. We, we want to blame our profession. We want to blame our organizations for not doing enough, for not doing the right thing. And, and I guess you need somebody with a more balanced and nuanced understanding like you to say that, hey, no, all doctors want to do the right things they've just been misguided. Thank you so much for that. But you know, I, I wanna ask you a question that the cardiac, the cardiac patient uh, would have heard and many well-educated cardiac patients will ask, should I be avoiding red meat? Has red meat caused my heart disease? Absolutely not. Uh, red meat is, a healthy food that we've been eating for centuries. It has important iron, which is bioavailable to us that we can absorb. 
It has got high quality animal protein that we need in order to build more muscle. And it has the least toxic fat that I can think of, which is beef tallow. If you're avoiding red meat, then you're eating chicken, perhaps pork, a lot of vegetables that are processed in vegetable oils. So uh, if you look at it, the worldwide consumption of red meat has actually gone down, especially in the United States. Whereas the consumption of poultry has gone up. Now poultry has a lot more omega-6, about six to 10%. Whereas red meat, is, especially if it is pasture raised, grass fed and grass finished, it has a one to one ratio one of omega-6 and one of omega-3. Whenever you increase omega-6, you take away the omega-3's role in dampening inflammation. Omega-3 is dampening inflammation. Omega-6 is increasing inflammation. So grass-fed and grass-finished beef is 1.4 omega-6 and one omega-3. Whereas corn-fed, cafo fed uh, beef will have 16 omega-6 to 1 omega-3. But even if you eat meat that is processed in CAFO plants, the red meat, the amount of omega-6 that will be present in that meat of the total fat content would be perhaps less than 1 to 2%. Mm -hmm. Whereas poultry will have about 6 to 10%. Pork will have 6 to 10%. So to demonize red meat as the cause of heart disease is another bad thing that we are doing rather than promoting it as one of the healthiest kind of food that you can eat. Right. So Thank you very let much. Me, uh, may I add? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Na Go ahead. Nadir is always has a level of scholarship and detail that is just light years ahead um, of of cardiologists, certainly, uh, but most all educated people. And what he said is absolutely correct. But let's take a, a step back. Why is it that people have this negative view of red meat? And understand there are different levels of misinformation. The first is it's ideolo ideological. Vegetarians just want to demonize meat in general, and red meat has been a target of theirs for over a century. Um, without any good science to justify it. The second, there is some incredibly bad science that justifies the fear of red meat. Uh, you have um, uh, you know, epidemiological and ecological studies. What you have are people eat the most red meat and particularly you're emphasizing processed meat. So the question is who eats the most bologna and, and hot dogs? Um, and so when you look at that, yes, the people who eat the most bologna and hot dogs have slightly more um, colon cancer and heart disease. But if you look closely at these studies, these people also, they smoke cigarettes more. They're more likely to be obese. Um, they're more likely to eat, they're, what are they eating along with the hot dogs? They don't have a plate of hot dogs by themselves. They're also eating more bread and ice cream and soda. Uh, and, and what happens is these vegetarian advocates of which you'll see them everywhere. I mean, you look at the nutrition department at Harvard and you see that these are strong vegetarian advocates and they ignore the fact that the people who eat the most processed meats, we're not really talking steak here. We're talking about hot dogs and bologna. The people who eat the most hot dogs are the ones who have the poorest lifestyle. These are the people who smoke the cigarettes and eat the most bread um, and have the standard American diet. And what they have decided is to focus on the processed meat. Um, and even then it's a relatively small difference between those and the rest of the people. So I think there are different ways to look at this. There's a mechanistic approach, which Nadir is an expert at, and there's sort of more the, the bigger picture, which is right now it's big industry. There's vegetarian industry promoting these fake burgers, which are loaded with the processed fake oils. Um, and even forms of protein that have never existed before in this world. And there are, there's big bucks to be gained by selling vegetarian products. And the way to do that is to demonize meat. Uh, so we, we need to be aware, why is it people fear um, 
LDL and red meat? And who is profiting from the fear of the LDL and meat? Let me also add, I meant to say this before, someone may wonder well, why is it statins have a benefit? Um, and so they do actually lower the incidence of heart disease. Uh, statins have other effects besides lowering LDL. It's very well established. Statins reduce inflammation and they actually do have a powerful anticoagulant effect. They do reduce clotting. And I think ultimately, if you're looking for the single critical mechanism of harm, and that's excessive clotting. Um, and statins do reduce clotting to some extent. And especially, it may very well be when people get stressed, they activate their clotting factors. And so it may very well be there's a small benefit of the statins because they reduce the clotting. Now, what's the alternative? Well, the way to reduce the clotting is to get the blood sugar low, control your stress, which will also reduce your, when you control your blood sugar, you're also reducing your blood pressure because all that extra glucose in the blood is attracting water. So you got about 60 molecules of water bound to each molecule of glucose. When you lower your blood sugar, you're lowering the water in your blood, you're naturally lowering your blood pressure. So one doesn't need to lower, and salt has been demonized as well for reasons I have no idea. Um, but the idea is you eat salt and therefore you're gonna raise your blood pressure. It's another very poor connection. So the best way to lower your blood pressure is lower your blood sugar and it'll naturally come down. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. You know, and uh, you actually, uh, th that was the next question I was going to ask you that um, is there benefits for some patients with a statin? And I think you've answered that beautifully. So one thing I want to um, talk about is that um, Dr. Ali, you spoke about um, patients and, you know, the therapeutics of it and they come to you. It's quite a, it's obviously a very stressful situation and cardiology is a very specialized specialty and interventional cardiology, you know, the stents are getting better and more drug eluting and, you know, the benefits, it's getting more technological. And when you look at how much time it takes to be a really good cardiologist and your patient ends up with you and you say well the treatment is simple eat real food <laughs> it's almost too simple and I, I mean I think all doctors have experienced medical doctors have experienced the patient coming to you with some form of symptom and they want to leave with something they want to leave with a prescription and I've, I've uh, angered many patients by not prescribing antibiotics for a viral illness, even though I've explained why they leave with a feeling of, you know, there's a bit of an anticlimax that I'm not taking something. So, you know, maybe the placebo effect or something like that. So it's really, really simple therapy. But now with the um, introduction of PCSK9 inhibitors. Maybe, David, do you want to talk about that as, as a role, um, you know, similar to the, in the line of statins? Is there any benefit? Does it have a role um, in patients with cardiovascular disease? You know, it's, we are fundamentally a lazy species. Um, when you say eat um, good quality food, eat real, real food, it's difficult, first of all, just to introduce the answer to your uh, question. Um, there's this, it's, it's sort of like a drug addiction. You could just say to someone, just stop smoking. Um, and they know that's unhealthy. Uh, stop taking drugs. So um, sure, you can say eat, eat good quality food, but there's a powerful addiction to, to sugar um, and combination sugar and fat. So it's very difficult for people and it's far easier to take a pill. And then the doctor says, now you'll be healthier. So that is one problem we have to overcome is people really need to appreciate that ultimately you don't find good health in a pill. And so changing your lifestyle is, is actually very difficult for the person that is sugar addicted. Um, they need to appreciate that there are rewards for changing the diet and lifestyle. Second, uh, there are a host of new drugs that have come out. The PCSK9 inhibitor drugs have now been out almost a decade you got a newer one, bempedoic acid, which has a different mechanism for lowering LDL. I understand, first of all, again, these PCSK9 inhibitors, um, which change the uh, receptor density of the LDL on the liver cells, um, they dramatically lower LDL levels. And again, the benefit is trivial. It typically reduces um, coronary events by maybe 1%. So again, 
which have been amplified to talk about it being 20 or 30%. Um, and understand the PCSK9 inhibitors have a secondary effect that statins don't. There is another component um, of a lipoprotein called lipoprotein A or LP little a, um, which is a bit of a mystery, I think, as completely understanding how it's involved in our metabolism. Um, but the downside is it, it is associated with heart disease and it's involved in our wound healing and clotting. The PCSK9 inhibitors, unlike the statins, will lower this LP little a. And again, LP little a is involved in heart disease and it's associated with heart disease. And it's very well correlated with the reduction in LDL. So again, the people who are promoting LDL causes harm, they will completely ignore the changes in the LP little a with, the, with this category of drugs. I mean, you can read their papers and see they don't mention LP little a, but it's there. And it may very well be that targeting LP little a, and I'm not promoting the idea that we wanna take medication to lower the LP little a, but that I think is an explanation for why there's a small benefit of the PCSK9 inhibitor drugs because they don't appear to affect coagulation or inflammation. There's another drug called bempedoic acid, which has just come out in this past year. And it changes the metabolism of the liver in a different way than statins do. And it's, this is the real deception. I have heard the people who are promoting bempedoic acid paper came out in which you had a very small reduction in coronary events, like 1%. They are promoting this drug as saying it reduces heart disease by 20%, which again is that inflated figure. But when they talk about the negative effects, then they use what's called the absolute risk reduction, which is the arithmetic reduction or, or uh, risk of, of adverse events. So you have 5% increase in, in harm to the kidney you have doubling of, of, um, of kidney stones, uh, of gallstones. You have severe adverse events with bempedoic acid, which are being downplayed by the adverse, by, by those who are uh, statin advocates. So they're saying, take a statin plus the bempedoic acid, take a statin plus the PCSK9 inhibitors. This is such a wrong way of thinking. And, and I welcome Nadir to, to chime in on this as well. The idea is, and I've heard cardiologists, certainly other than Adir say this, that LDL is intrinsically harmful, that LDL causes heart disease. So we must get it to be as low as possible. And this is a complete wrong way of thinking. And you even have, I've seen this, this is madness. You have genetic manipulation of people. You are changing the DNA of people who have hypercholesterolemia so that they're less able to produce LDL. You're changing their DNA. This is madness to lower your DNA by changing your genes. And so there ultimately is no end to the different strategies that the drug companies have come up with to lower LDL. And this is all promoted with the idea that we must demonize LDL, which therefore ultimately promotes profits for the drug companies and, and I actually look at it, it's fine for the drug companies to have this strategy because their single goal is to make money, but that the key opinion leaders are also behind this because they're very well paid. Um, that's that's a, an atrocity. Well, I see now if I have a minute, I want to just say a thing about PCSK9 inhibitors if possible, but I know that the session ends at 10. So I'd let you decide. Go, go ahead, the floor is yours. The PCSK9 inhibitor is perhaps the worst way of trying to treat heart disease. And the reason for that is that they do all the wrong things. Now, there are people who have what is called loss of function mutation of PCSK9. So in other words, they don't make enough PCSK9. It's as if they are on a PCSK9 inhibitor so these people have a lot more LDL receptors in their liver and their LDL levels are low. But it just doesn't do that alone because it also increases the VLDLR receptor. So the receptor that takes up triglycerides. So if you see these people, they have fatty liver and fatty pancreas and are genetically at a higher risk of becoming a diabetic. 
So by giving PCSK9 inhibitor, you're duplicating that situation in which the liver gets fatty, the pancreas gets fatty, the heart gets fatty. And if you look at the studies done with PCSK9 inhibitor, not only is there no mortality benefit, in other words, in the primary study, 14,000 patients were given PCSK9 inhibitor. The LDL went down to 30 grams, 30 milligrams per deciliter with zero mortality benefit. But there is tremendous amount of data that shows that these people are at greater risk of diabetes based on the potency of treatment and the duration of treatment. And the data from animal studies and loss of function mutation of PCSK9 amply illustrates the increased risk of metabolic syndrome. So it's unconscionable for the medical community to promote PCSK9 inhibitors because they do everything wrong. So really what we've been talking about is um, that the focus needs to be on understanding metabolic health and what is critical to ensuring metabolic health and what factors worsen the metabolic health. And, you know, both of you have spoken so beautifully about all the contributing factors to the, the metabolic mayhem that we're seeing, a tsunami um, of patients. And I think that the more people are brave enough to take the blinders off and go and, and do the reading and just simply read about insulin resistance and um, the foods that worsen insulin resistance, the more um, the, the, the more patients will benefit um, in the long run. Before we go, there is a, uh, a, a one of our longstanding viewers who's uh, sent a quick question that I'm going to read. He says, it's uh, from Ian Gorner. Hi, Ian. Thanks for watching. He says, I read a study from the Journal of Nuclear Medicine that statin use seems to be, seems to uh, increase, seems to increase the incidence of, I think he means Alzheimer's disease uh, two times, twofold. Would you tend to concur with that finding? Is there any association of statin use and Alzheimer's disease? No, absolutely. And uh, there are several people who have looked into it, but I just want to give a simple mechanistic answer to that. And the reason I do that is because almost all physicians that have come across have no understanding of cerebral or brain cholesterol metabolism. And it would surprise people to know that the brain is the richest organ in cholesterol. 25% of the brain's body's cholesterol is in the brain. But the brain does not take any cholesterol that you have eaten or any cholesterol that the liver makes, because there is something called the blood-brain barrier that prevents any LDL, any cholesterol from crossing into the brain. So what that means is that the brain makes the entirety of its own cholesterol from simple molecules like acetyl-CoA. You could say it makes it from hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. So it's got 25 different enzymatic steps through which it's making its cholesterol. And that's in the book chapter. However, all statins cross the blood brain barrier and disrupt cerebral cholesterol production. And one brain cell communicates with another brain cell through cholesterol connections because the neurotransmitter receptors are in a cholesterol rich domain of the brain cell. And if you take the cholesterol away, these neurotransmitter receptors don't function well. You will not conduct connections between the brains as easily. So it's not surprising that even the FDA in its package insert says that there can be possible cognitive and memory issues from taking statin medications. This is a point that is not emphasized enough the physicians are not aware of cerebral cholesterol metabolism. I think that's something that should be promoted. So your long-term viewer asked a very good question. 
Thank allow you. Me to, yeah. Do we have ahead. time for me to expand on, on that? Absolutely. Go ahead. We're a little bit over, but we'll, you, you're very welcome. So I, I agree with everything Nadir said, but to expand on it, so the, the brain has some protection. Unlike the other organs, the brain is protected from uh, substances simply being allowed to pass into the brain. It's called the blood-brain barrier. And many drugs cannot get into the brain or they get into the brain very poorly. And so the statins have different capacities for getting into the brain through the blood-brain barrier. Um, one weak one is Crestor and Lipitor pretty much just flows right into the brain. We published a paper on this in which we looked at the structure of the different statins and how efficient they could get into the brain with Lipitor being one of the most efficient drugs in getting into the brain. And so Lipitor therefore would interfere with the ability of the brain to make cholesterol. And Lipitor is in the category of drugs that have the most adverse cognitive events reported to the FDA. Uh, and so when a person on Lipitor goes to the doctor and says, I have failed memory, um, the doctor should be aware that the Lipitor is interfering with brain functioning. Now, I emphasize that there was a study published about a decade ago, which has been entirely ignored, um, but it's so important. You have 75-year-old people, all of whom have gone to their doctors and reported impaired memory. They are diagnosed with dementia. They were diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. All of these people, 75-year-old men and women, were taken off of their statins. A month later, they no longer have dementia, formally diagnosed in the doctor's office. This is the critical manipulation. They were all put back on their statins. Once again, they're all diagnosed with dementia, formally diagnosed with dementia. This is so important because we have millions of people, older adults on statins, and we have an epidemic of Alzheimer's disease. We don't know how many of those people diagnosed with Alzheimer's have impaired brain functioning only because they're taking a statin and that they actually have a normal functioning brain which is being impaired by taking this drug. And what's a shame, what I think is a travesty is that no one has followed up on this paper to explicitly study people who have impaired brain functioning, impaired cognition, and then study what happens when they are taken off the medication. So I agree completely with Nadir that we have to recognize the brain is a special, very special organ. It produces its own cholesterol. And if we interfere with that process and the brain needs cholesterol to make memories, when we interfere with that process, we end up with what appears to be dementia, but it's really just a biochemical process which has been uh, suppressed. Thank you so much. And I think uh, it's, we have focused on the patient with coronary artery disease. We've focused on how, uh, or heart disease, we've focused on how the wrong um, route of sort of chronic therapy um, is followed and that the real therapy is completely ignored. And in fact, the therapy that is given is harmful or may be harmful to the patient in many different ways. One way that you've highlighted is in uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease or some form of cognitive um, impairment. What we haven't spoken about, which I do want to highlight before we sign off, is that those patients who have a diagnosis of coronary artery disease, they usually have children. And those children have had exposure to processed food for possibly longer than the parent or the, the, you know, the actual patient. So the generation before, uh, the generation, the, uh, the next generation, uh, the younger generation has had exposure to processed food, um, vegetable oils and that sort of thing, high sugar diet, that inflammation for a lot longer than the life cycle of the person. So it's so important that when we deal with this, that we also deal with preventative medicine and we um, explain to the families that you are genetically predisposed to this type of illness. Um, so before we sign off, I would like to ask for some closing comments around the topic of cholesterol um, and food that you eat. And so I'll start with Dr. Ali. Um, should we fear 
So the question is to both of you, should we fear cholesterol? Do you measure your cholesterol? And what is the typical diet you prescribe for your cardiology patients? Sure, you know, I do this on a daily basis. And so I would say that it's almost impossible to eat out because whenever you eat out, you're gonna get processed food and vegetable oils. So you have to learn how to cook yourself. You have to stay away from refined carbs and added sugar. You should focus on real food, which is meat that is cooked with its own fat, eggs, cheese, fish, shrimps. And you should add above ground vegetables things that you have cooked on your own because whenever you go to any restaurant, even if you buy meat, many times the meat is cooked with vegetable oils and many times it has a base, which is onions that are fried in vegetable oil, which is one of the worst. Most Indian restaurants will serve you that. In addition to that, you should very importantly address the same thing for your next progeny because in the history of this great country, the United States, for the first time in its history, our children are gonna have a lower lifespan than their parents. It has never ever happened before. And I think that the processed food is a lot to blame for that. Added to that, other key lifestyle issues is intermittent fasting and exercise. And those are well elaborated in many different talks. I will not get into it, but if you're eating that way and you're fasting, you're well on your way to health. You will be dropping many medications. You would be improving your health in ways that are several orders of magnitude higher than prescriptive medicine. So I'll let David finish with his closing. Perfect, thank you. So first I of course agree with Nadir's closing and so allow me to, to provide some complementary approaches. First of all, your question about cholesterol, there is absolutely no reason to fear cholesterol in your food or in your blood. It's important to recognize that this is just the perfect storm in which you have people who do have the best of intentions but are simply wrong, who are basically anti-meat for decades, and there just simply isn't any good evidence to support this fear of red meat, uh, animal source protein, or cholesterol. Let me add to that, that people don't appreciate how incredibly important cholesterol is to good health. Um, what is out there, and I lecture on this, people with the highest cholesterol are healthier than people with low cholesterol. And the reason for that is quite simple. Cholesterol is a part of our immune system. I mean, the cardiologists are always afraid of cholesterol, but the immunologists know that Cholesterol works with our white blood cells to kill bacteria and also to target cancer cells. People with the highest cholesterol have a significantly lower rate of death from cancer and infectious disease. So instead of fearing cholesterol, we should embrace high cholesterol and see it as something that is beneficial. So I think the parting message should be that we need to understand that we are naturally um, uh, designed to process, to consume animal-based food. And whether it's meat or any other form, I mean, fish is absolutely fantastic to consume as well, but we shouldn't fear animal-based food. We should embrace animal-based food um, and we should embrace high cholesterol as being healthy, but also recognize the powerful drug-like effect that sugar has on us. And so we shouldn't think of medication that good health comes in a pill and that if we really wanna have successful aging, you wanna be healthy as you get old, it's best to take charge and address root cause of disease, which can be difficult. Um, but ultimately I think you're rewarded with far better health as you get old. Oh, thank you so much to both of you um, for such clarity. And it's really been such an enjoyable hour that's just flown by. I wish we had more time. 
Thank you for the hours and hours and hours that you've put into this incredible chapter. And I can only hope and uh, really just be hopeful that people are open-minded enough to open up that textbook, to take it to your doctor if your doctor hasn't or doesn't believe in the science of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction. And for this to be the change um, that we all hope to see um, and, and the shift in this trend that we see with metabolic disease. Thank you so much to all of you watching. Thank you to my wonderful guests and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Hasina, so much for inviting me and to Nadir as well for working with me. Thank you, Hasina, and thank you, David. We compliment each other, I think, and I really yeah. thank you for uh, laying clarity to wherever I missed things. So you, you are amazing. Ah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.